Hi, Nancy. Hi, it's John, John Keister. Um, I, hey, congratulations, you have the, the 10 years on this. You do a show, and it's Art Zone. It's about the arts, and I, that's good. You've been doing that for 10 years. I hope you're having fun with that. I do. I hope you're, because that's important. And I was just saying, what? Oh, they're serving, they're, they're serving us lunch now. I gotta go. Anyway, congratulations. I'M COMING! and welcome to the show. I'm Nancy Guppy here at beautiful Georgetown Stables and we've got an excellent lineup for you this week. Take a look. A kung fu comedy. These three aging kung fu uh, classmates who find out their master is killed and they have to avenge their master. Basically fight a revenge match but then pick up kids from soccer. Ten tiny dances. Hello, I'm Julie Cassiopo. Julie Cassiopo's calendar? Curating this calendar of events. Hey, baby. And Brett Benton's blues. Hey, girl, love you down the We'll begin with Fogue Studios and Gallery, a new space in Georgetown that is hell-bent on redefining what it means to be an artist over 50. I started my career in retail and retail marketing and merchandising, and so I did that for probably 30 years in a lot of different venues. I ended up being an executive director of product development and marketing for a big, huge cosmetic company in LA. And then I got let go at 53 years old. And I decided to come back up to Seattle and I couldn't find a job. So I started doing my art again. Sold 10 pieces in a month, started going to gallery openings and I started meeting a lot of people like me that were older, that were looking for places to show or were showing but were looking for more opportunity. And I decided to start this gallery for artists over 50 and exclusively over 50. Vogue Studios and Gallery opened in 2018. Now we have 6,000 square feet, the entire floor, five working studios, 37 visual artists, and it literally happened in six months. We have five studios. One of them is mine, which is right behind me. The other studios are rented by the year, and the artist has full-time access to them 24-7. They have a key to the building. I started in about 2012 working seriously as an encaustic artist, which is painting with hot beeswax that's mixed with Damar. That's a tree resin that helps harden the wax over time. But I also started collaging things into my art, so I do encaustic, encaustic collage, and collage. Always thought I was going to be an artist. Other things got in the way. I had a great career at Nordstrom in visual merchandising. From that I became a full-time florist. So coming here, having a chance to have this beautiful space, been here a couple of months uh, into my year lease, and um, I'm loving it. We have a real variety of artists here. We have people that have been lifelong artists. We also have people that are now getting into art as they're retired. It's their time. The kids are grown, and that's a big part of it. I started college as an art major and met my future wife and decided, you know what, I don't think I can make enough money as an artist and so I became an engineer. One day at the peak of my earning power, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna quit working in tech and I'm going to pursue my passion. And so that's how I've become a full-time artist last couple years. So I do think we should put this one um, on the inside wall. Okay. I wanted to create a space for artists that was driven by artists. So that'll fit just right when I'm looking at it right here. So I take a very, very low percentage of only 15%. So the artist walks away with 85% of the sale. 
It's not a get rich quick scheme for me at all, but that's okay. Nothing makes me happier than selling someone's art. Going to Houston. Once a month on Sunday nights, we have an artist, what we call our artist talks. And that what that really is, is an informal gathering. We get to know each other better. We have fun. It's very casual. So all these ideas are just stacked up, just knocking and waiting to get out. It's really something that I wanted to bring back that I remember from when I was an artist, when I was in school and we all got together and talked about art, but we smoked cigarettes at the time, so we don't do that anymore because we're older and we're smarter now. Yeah. So I still do it. For me, as a longtime showing artist, I was interested in showing in a gallery and being part of a gallery where the curation was top notch. She sets things so there are low costs, beautiful style and environment, and offers an opportunity for artists to make their best living at creating their work. The second Saturday of every month, we have our Art Attack from six to nine. We have wine, we have snacks, and the artists are here. And you can go and watch people work. You can watch demos, which is a really unique and fun thing. And if I don't like it, I can cover it all up with something else. We have over 200 works of art in this building. There's a lot to look at, and it's a huge, great party. We want to show people that we're not, you know, on a Centrum Silver ad, <laughs> riding our bikes and smiling. You know, it's like we have more to offer than that. When people come here and they light up and they're talking to one another, and they're feeling good about themselves and they're feeling important, it's everything. It's everything. Learn more about Fogue Studios and Gallery, including how to submit your artwork at FogueStudios.com. Filmmaker Bao Tran received wide acclaim for his 2008 short film, Bookie, and he was the editor of the action blockbuster, Sholon, as well as Jackpot, Vietnam's official entry in the 2016 Oscars. Bao is currently hard at work on The Paper Tigers, a highly anticipated action drama comedy slated for release in 2020. And here to talk about the movie is the writer and the director himself, Bao Tran. Hello. Hello. Um, so the Paper Tigers, it's been a long time coming. Yep. Congratulations. You wrote it around 2011, something like that? Thank you. Yes, the script I wrote about uh, started with a one-page treatment that yeah. we started pitching in 2011. Yeah. And ever since then, never looked back. <laughs> never looked back. Yeah. What's the basic storyline of the movie? Well, the basic story of the film is about these three aging kung fu uh, classmates who are now estranged from each other. Uh, but they find out their master is killed and they have to avenge their master. But now they have kids, they have jobs, they have wives, <laughs> and they have lives to lead. And uh, it's just kind of like all the drama and comedy that ensues from that, uh, of having to basically fight your fight a, a revenge match, but then pick up your kids from soccer beforehand. So that's kind of the fun idea that we want to play. Yeah, what a, what a good contest there. <laughs> yeah. And you know, most people, or many people, would think of uh, martial arts uh, movies as nonstop action, but this film is very relationship and very character driven. Was that an important to you? Yeah, it's a huge point for me. I, I think, um, you know, I think even to have good action scenes, you have to have a good story and it'll mm -hmm. help, help uh, re people relate to it and be invested mm -hmm. in the action scenes more when you have characters you care about. Right, right. Ah. Who did this? Carter. He said his gun flow was better, so I challenged him to a Baymall. And your brother's with you. Our kung fu is to help, not to hurt. Don't make the same mistakes that I made. Now, I know as a kid, you were you kind of forced to learn martial arts by your parents. Yeah. And you didn't want to, but then you <clears throat> kind of you kind of took it on. Is it that was right? a weird thing. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was a bit of a couch potato, <laughs> uh, latchkey kid, and parents. Uh, I was, you know, children of an uh, immigrant generation, so they were all working, and I was just kind of like left to my own devices. So they made me go do martial arts to do something with myself. Mm -hmm. And look at me now. Hey, look at you now. Man, <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah. you're a martial arts mm, master. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Are any of the characters uh, kind of re represent you or your friends? Uh, well, the story is like very much, it's set in here in Seattle. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to pay tribute, first of all, to kind of the rich martial arts history that Seattle has. And a lot of people 
um, might be aware that Bruce Lee spent his early years here, mm -hmm. and at that, in that time he had taught um, a lot of people uh, kung fu uh, that were non-Chinese, and at mm -hmm. that time it was very much uh, frowned upon by the Chinese community, and met, kung fu was meant for Chinese people only. So for Bruce to do that, that was very um, trailblazing wow. and very um, different. Where did you learn how to direct action films? Um, well, a lot of things is self-taught. I grew up watching a lot of Hong Kong films and uh, just figuring out how to do it, uh, I guess, um, from a mechanical point of view, you kind of go out, take your camcorder and kind of copy what they were doing and then just figure out from there. So. And you had a mentor, right? Yeah, so I was fortunate to have a mentor in Corey Yoon. Corey Yoon is um, one of the great Hong Kong film directors who had grown up with Jackie Chan and mm. Salma Hong, just kind of from that generation of filmmakers. Um, so, you know, he was a family friend and I was able to kind of show him the stuff that I was working on. He'd give me feedback and just kind of give me all the things that, um, you know, would help me get better. And that was really helpful. So. Well, I wanted to mention that you pitched the Paper Tigers to Hollywood Studios and you got some serious interest. Yeah. Like maybe like a like $4 million budget or something like yeah. that. But you did not go the Hollywood route. And why did you not do that? Well, you know, yeah, we did had a lot of interest, number one, and we had a lot of um, different offers of different variations, but kind of the main theme was, hey, can you have a white guy as your main character or change one of the, one of the, your less three musketeers? Less Asian <laughs> yeah, in the film. Less Asian. Can you somehow make it less Asian? Wow. With more money. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of the, the things that we always knew that um, we were going to get, because this is a common challenge that uh, POC filmmakers or POC stories have, mm -hmm. um, and something that we, did, we knew that was a hard line for us to mm -hmm. not cross. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was also something that we was kind of a no-brainer. We just wanted to make it on our terms and tell the story authentically. No more demo. No more challenges. When on, on the other hand, I read that you, there were some Asian investors who were uncertain about the martial arts topic, I think. Yeah. Um, what was their concern? Financiers from Asia, it's a little bit of old hat. Like, kung fu movies are a diamond dozen over there. so. Mm -hmm. Um, for them to want to get involved with a film that's here in the U.S., it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, for Asian Americans or, 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 or immigrant Asians, uh, it's a different conversation because their kung fu has become our stereotype in stereotype. a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has mm -hmm. become like any Asian that you would see on screen or on film now are probably doing martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there was pushback as far as like how come we're not moving the ball forward, how come we're not portraying mm -hmm. Asians in the more nuanced or different light and or different genres. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was kind of like things were kind of stuck between two worlds on that, mm -hmm. but we just love Kung Fu. You said that you wanted to uh, present Asian men as they really are um, and not a stereotype. So how, do you, yeah. how did you do that in the film? Our main character, for example, is newly divorced and he has to deal with um, this new normal of uh, co-parenting with his ex-wife and but he's not very good at it so that, I think that's a shade that we don't often see and I think it's gonna be interesting to be able to show that also in a cool kung fu movie absolutely yeah, yeah that's just normal that's just normal, normal life, life. exactly totally yeah normal life. well you're an accomplished uh, film editor so how does your editing background affect your directing or does it yeah, I think it definitely does. Mm -hmm. uh, being a film editor, you are basically trying to figure out all the best parts of every footage, all this footage that you shoot, mm -hmm. and then making you know a coherent story out of it. So in a lot of ways, you're working backwards. Mm -hmm. When you're coming on set with an editor perspective, you're figuring out the things you need and you absolutely need versus the things you don't. So it saves time. It makes you more efficient. It makes you a little bit more clear about what you need. Uh, and I think that that's really helped me on that. Um, who is the audience for the Paper Tigers? Have you thought about that? Yeah, well, I think the audience would be ideally people who are nostalgic about kung fu films yes. and are at least open to it. And I think we want to surprise them. A lot of people who are our age or yeah. middle age or dealing with midlife crises sure. who will see these guys as real underdogs. Yeah. And I think young people really like it too. Um, we always liked uh, Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of oh, the Dead. So funny. Yeah, so, so good. 
Yeah, well, that was the way we kind of think about it. We want to do for kung fu movies what Shaun of the Dead did for zombie movies. And it's just really um, fresh, different, but also loving to the genre and loving to, to the story. That's so. a great little line there. The yeah. You just said, that's a great little tagline, right? Yeah. 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 Just like Shaun of the Dead. Just like <laughs> Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. You'll love it. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us. Congratulations on this film. What a, what a huge accomplishment. And we're going to look forward to seeing it in 2020. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a delight. How many times have you visited Bruce Lee's grave? Oh gosh, any time a visitor's in town, you take I'll, 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 yeah. they'll, they'll probably want to see it or I'll bring it up and they want to see it. Yeah, yeah, sure, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. What a man. Empty your mind. Hello, sir. Hi, Nancy. So, um, our director, Vincent Pierce, who saw you last uh, July in Pioneer Square playing, mm -hmm. he texted me and basically said, you got to get this guy. <laughs> so, we're so happy <laughs> right to on, have man. you. Um, so, right why on. don't we introduce uh, your cohorts here, starting back here. Well, uh, this is Mr. Arthur Ortega back here on the drums. Arthur? And this is Mr. Jesse James on the bass. Hey, you guys. Nice to have you here. Um, now, you grew up in the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, where? Uh, so I was born in uh, Alabama, mm -hmm. and I lived in southern Alabama, like northern Florida area, okay. pretty much my whole life. And surrounded by music from the get-go? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I have uh, family members that play, you know, I and mean, there's always music going on down yeah. there, so if I wasn't around people playing it, I mean, I'd be listening to it otherwise and playing it myself. So you play a style of blues, country blues, mm -hmm. right? So for someone who isn't, doesn't know everything about the blues, like myself, what specifically does that mean, country blues? So country blues is a, is a genre that, um, you know, them folks in northern Mississippi, they couldn't afford radios, you know, mm -hmm. they couldn't afford uh, to hire whole bands. They couldn't afford to uh, go, I mean, especially couldn't afford to go out and see shows. I mean, you know, it was very rural down there. And so uh, they would, they came up with this real rhythmic music. And it's like, uh, you're playing like the rhythm and the lead at the same time. You know, some mm. folks can dance at their house parties. And, right. you know, you got one person doing it all. But what we do is 
like an extension okay. of that. Of that. So. And so you just recorded uh, last in, in April your first studio album, mm -hmm. right? And it's called You Got to Pray mm -hmm. on the Knickknack uh, label, which yep. is here in Seattle. Um, is that uh, You Got to Pray? Is that figuratively or literally <laughs> both? <laughs> both. Yes. Yeah, you got to do both. It's, it's something my grandmama used to tell me when I was a kid, you know. Uh -huh. and, and ever since I started playing music, I mean, she, you know, she just. She came to see me one time, mm -hmm. one of my first big shows. We played this big theater down in Pensacola, and she came and she uh, she had just gotten cancer treatment, mm -hmm. and she came and listened to me play, and uh, she said it, it just recharged her whole soul. You know what I mean? And, that's fabulous. You know, Music and will do that. it will. Music it will. will. Do that. That's right. why we do it. That's why you do it. You know? Right. And there is the. A CD right there, by the way. So um, you got, and also I know you got some really uh, royalty on this record, uh, playing on this record, yep. right? Some some Delta yep. Blues royalty. Uh, yeah. So Cedric Burnside, yeah. mm -hmm. he's the grandson of uh, mm -hmm. R.L. Burnside. Mm -hmm. uh, he's good friends of ours, and uh, he is a good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was down there in uh, Mississippi. We were on tour last year, and he basically like was like, yeah, man, I'll come in. Well, that says something right there. Yeah. I mean, that says something. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. So you got a couple songs for us, and mm -hmm. off, the, off the record, what are you going to do first? What's up first? So it'll be the title track called mm -hmm. You Got to Pray. You Got to Pray. Mm -hmm. I think we all need a little bit of that. I hear you. All right, you ready <laughs> to, uh, to pray? Yeah. Guys, you ready well, to pray? Yeah. All right, we'll ladies and gentlemen, that. Brett Benton. <laughs> When the rain's shaking you home, your friends ain't around, baby. Lord knows you got to save yourself before you try. The river water been rising above the ground. Lord knows you've been crying so loud that you can't. Thank you all. 
pick up You Gotta Pray in your favorite indie record store or online and catch the band live with Reverend Peyton's Big Damn Band on Sunday, October 27th at the Tractor Tavern. Hello, I'm Julie Cassiopo, curating this calendar of events. First up, a spectacular exhibit featuring the artwork of James Castle. Born in rural Idaho in 1899, James was deaf and never learned to speak or sign. From a very young age, drawing what he saw on his parents' farm, James captured people, animals, and landscapes with his own ink mixture of spit and soot on scraps of paper and discarded materials. Catch the show at Greg Cusera Gallery now through November 2nd. Just in time for Halloween, Seattle Radio Theater presents the suspenseful thriller, Sorry, Wrong Number. This classic radio drama is filled with live music, live sound effects, mystery, and murder. It all happens on October 29th at Town Hall, Seattle, and live on Cairo Radio. Next, a bold new show from artist Jillian Theobald, titled, And the Language Was Beauty. Jillian is a master of color. This show features her abstract paintings and a series of dynamic signature collages made from found packaging and acrylic that have been manipulated into layers suggesting a playful exploration of space. On view now through November 16th at Studio E Gallery. And I'm excited to invite you to my cabaret show at the Pink Door. As an international jazz and cabaret chanteuse, I put my heart and soul into every performance. I recently returned from Norway, where I connected with my ancestry on the reality show Alt for Norga, which translates to All for Norway. I am bringing this experience into my show and dedicating one set to my Norwegian heritage. You can join me on Friday, October 25th at the Pink Door. Thanks, Julie. And we have one more idea for your fun things to do list. Back by popular demand is 10 Tiny Dances, a showcase featuring an evening of 10 dances between three and eight minutes long, performed on a four by four foot stage. Well, what's so cool about this format is that this tight space restriction inspires choreographers and dancers to think and create outside of their comfort zone, which, more often than not, results in wonderfully unique and compelling performances. A 10 Tiny Dances takes place October 24, 5, and 6 at On the Boards on Lower Queen Anne, and ticket information is at ontheboards.org. And that is a wrap. Big thanks to Georgetown Stables for hosting us. And thanks to you, of course, for tuning in. Have a swell week, and we'll see you real soon. Thank y'all so much. 
Art Zone is filmed on location at Georgetown Stables, the coolest event space in Seattle. More information is at georgetownstables.com.